I think we should probably start with how you got into commentating and how that transition happened from pro cyclist to commentator. Uh, yeah, mine was when I wasn't selected for the 2014 Tour de France. Um, Ned Bolting gave my sister a call and, uh, and said, what's David doing? It's only five days before a tour. And at the, mo the time I was planning on going back to Spain because I was in the UK and my sister said, I don't know actually, let me speak to him. And at that point in time I was like, the tour can go and shove it. And, uh, and my sister said, you know what, you should probably go and do this. It's probably be good for you to go to the tour and not feel like you're left out and anyway it might be good for the future. And that's where the relationship began. It was kind of with Ned, they met the whole team and, and it planted the seed I think in their heads that there could be something more than just being a pundit and uh, a kind of a man on the ground. And what's your favourite element of, of, of commentary? Is it telling the story? Is it giving your, your, your personal insight? Um, I suppose my favourite element is the fact that um, I watch bike racing. I wouldn't do it otherwise. I, I honestly probably wouldn't have the time or, yeah, I just wouldn't watch it. So it's quite, it's kept me in there. My sister was right. It's given me that halfway house rather than just cutting the cord. And when it's good racing, I love it. It reminds me of just how much I love the sport and why I did it for so many years because I, I can feel it, I'm there, I'm, I, I, I can project myself completely into the race, which is lovely. And how do you find working with, with Gary and Ned, two people coming from a journalist background? Does that help? Does I mean, Ned and Gary and the whole team have been so generous with me and Doc, the director. Uh, Gary is an institution. You know, you kind of take it for granted when you've seen him on TV for years, you just think that kind of that he just does that like that. Then you work with him and you realise how obsessive he is and how uh, he's such a perfectionist and everything's scripted and he's there before the race for hours, after for hours, getting it all put together. And that was fascinating. And Ned's just a, a bundle of energy and, and it's amazing what he's learned in such a short space of time. And, and seeing, it was, it was great with Ned and me because we got to both begin commentary at the same time. So we created a dynamic from the ground up. It wasn't me having to go in and fit into his uh, sort of style. Or the other way around, we, we sort of built a, a, a symbiotic style, which uh, is great. And thank God we get on well, because we spend the whole time together at the Tour de France and races like this. And he likes sport a lot more than me now. It's like I'm kind of often like, I don't want to do that. You're going to run or a bike ride. But uh, apart from that, it's great. And it's a, a great relationship. And it makes it easier, because we sit next to each other all day in a commentary box. And we get in a car and sit next to each other. We just eat together, stay in the same hotels. And so it is three weeks of very intense uh, proximity. And um, favourite race to commentate on? Is there, whether it be the whole race or, or a stage? Yeah, I think Dauphiné. Mm -hmm. I've always loved the Dauphiné. I mean, I love the Vuelta as my favourite race, but it's a weird one to commentate on because it's so erratic, if you like. And, uh, but the Dauphiné is great cause it's like a mini Tour de France. It's got all the good bits without the bad bits. And we do it from here as well. We do it from Ealing Studios. So it's eight days and get all the big stars, the, the famous climbs, all roads I know and the riders I know. So the Dauphiné is a, 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 a joy to commentate on. Commentating live and doing, say, a highlights commentary, uh, is there a different approach to that? Yeah, they're, they're so different. Uh, live commentary, there's adrenaline. It's kind of, you know you've got to be switched on the whole time, you, you can't relax. The, the problem with the highlight commentary is that you're switched off a lot of it waiting to kind of build it they build the show up as you've probably seen it's part one part two part three part four this is where it's interesting for people to understand as well if you like ned is the commentator i'm the color so ned's role as the commentator and lead commentator is to essentially take the viewer on the the journey emotionally and kind of and also uh, manage the director's uh, desires of like we're going to a break we need to soft out okay we're coming back in okay can you give an up some uh, can you tell them this? So he's getting all that. So I'm getting it in my ear as well, but I don't have to actually follow the instructions. And so whenever I talk, it's simply uh, getting inside the skin. That's right. It's sort of. It's almost like I'm just trying to share my experiences. But Ned's actually got to run and manage the whole show. So it's, too, it's a lovely sort of uh, dynamic. And in the highlight show, it's even that's even more accentuated in the sense that it's more complicated because you have to do really focused little blocks, c chopping in and out while you're live commentating that you know is recorded, that that's then going to be cut up. So actually, it's harder to do the, the highlight commentary because you dip in and out. And so you have to kind of take people on that emotional journey, but it's a broken off emotional journey. Is there someone you'd like to interview? Um, I don't do, in I don't interview writers. No, no. But would, would, would that be something you'd like to do in the future? Or is that no. not your, no. <laughs> no. I don't okay. want, no, I just don't think it, I don't, no, I'd like to keep that distance, okay. yeah. yeah. 
Uh, and as a rider yourself, yeah. was that something which came easy? Well, being interviewed is fine. Mm -hmm. I don't mind that because that's easy. It's actually really hard. I mean, you're doing it now, and I, I appreciate how hard it is to interview somebody. We take it for granted, but if you ever ask somebody to then interview somebody else, they realize how hard it is. I know it's not something I'm particularly good at. I can do I know if I taught myself, I could, but it's, I don't think it's my forte, to be perfectly frank. So I'll avoid it. And the Vuelta this year, how have you found the race? And compared to the other Grand Tours this year, how do you think it sort of stacks up? Yeah, I love the Vuelta. Um, I love this. There's this great stat, I think, let me get this right, 2015 or 2016 of Vuelta. Um, actually, that year's Grand Tours. Um, there were, I think, 14 uh, winners, stage winners in the Vuelta Spanish who'd never won a Grand Tour stage. There were seven uh, in the Giro d'Italia, uh, and there was only one at the Tour. And that was a, such a great example of the hierarchy of the three Grand Tours. The Vuelta is made up of fresh people, kind of young riders kind of coming out, testing their legs. They then move up to the next rank, which is the Giro, and then they get to the Tour. And you can see how it gets harder and harder to win, the kind of the closer you get to the Tour. By the time you get to the Tour, very few virgin riders kind of pop their cherry at the Tour. They have to have done it at the Vuelta. And the Vuelta is where the most, I think, it's the most dynamic racing. It's where we see the most interesting things. It's not predictable. It's uh, you do have the prediction, the certain elements to it. But it's, uh, I, I like it, and that's why I loved it as a bike racer as well. Okay, thank you very much. Pleasure. Cool. Cool.